Good morning. I come in here. We had a great time at meet and greet. How many of you enjoy meet and greet when you get here? Some of us enjoy it too much as I did this morning. I know better to go in there. I got to sing following this. So let's stand. I come in here saying I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. We all are. Let's worship the Lord. Let's sing. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your ready in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. Now you're warmed up. Let's pick it up and do it all again a little quicker. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of Peace, mighty God, O oh Lord God Almighty. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you. you. May be seated as you're doing so. Please find that little book there somewhere in that pew that you would sign your name so we know that you were here today. <sighs> I have announcements. Why are we ringing all of a sudden there? You're a little bit robbing somewhere. A couple of things I'd like to mention so I don't forget. I'd like to recognize Jay Yek over here this morning. Seth isn't here, but they won their districts yesterday and on to regional in baseball. We're proud of them. What did Taryn do? What all did Taryn do? It was a good day for the Yek family and the Eagles, and also for today is a good day for Timberly. It's birthday. Woohoo! Let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Timberly. Happy birthday to you. We appreciate our Yek family. I tell you, it means something to me every time I see Jeff show up while he's on duty in that uniform. It just, I don't know. We pray for those guys daily. Okay, uh, other announcements are the regular ones. I'm assuming we'll have an elders meeting Tuesday. Uh, what else? Uh, Monday evening, elders, what did we say? Six o'clock or just whenever you can get here, I think, five thirty, six o'clock. Uh, we're still working on the drainage problem out here. We're going to do that tomorrow evening. Hopefully, I think before next week, you'll see new sod out here along the street in the backyard. We're going to get that done. Uh, things happening. Uh, next week is Mother's Day. Is that where we're going to recognize seniors? I think that I think we are. <laughs> it usually is. Uh, next next week we have three seniors. Uh, Jay and Gracie and uh, Casey, yes, Casey. So we'll think of some special things to do for them next week also as we recognize them. Anything else that you would like to share, Kim? Got them on, Robin, or she's, Tatum's hitting it like it. Huh? There it is. You're on um, a praise. Um, this th last Thursday, we had a an amazing um, program that went on, and um, it was so cool to see all of the kids dressed up, and they did amazing. Um, this was Beth's last performance, and um, she, it was amazing. I, I praise you and thank you um, for everything you've done for my kids, 
and they're wonderful. And of course, her daughter as well, Autumn, um, she did an amazing job. So um, it was it was magical. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter got first at uh, Tri-State and uh, for her solo and as well as um, her duet. I just want to remind the seniors that today is the deadline for the scholarship applications to be turned into me for uh, the CWF scholarship. Thank you. I'd just like to ask that the uh, missions ministry team meet in the adult Sunday school room just after the service. We only need a couple minutes, maybe five. The train will roll again Thursday night for the seniors. We have a wonderful time. And also, we need to put Kim Fair in prayer. She broke her right leg. It was a clean break, but she broke her wrist, too. And they did a extense surgery on her wrist. So we need to keep her in prayer. Okay. Kim Fair. Up here in the front. Philip. One of my coworkers, uh, Deborah Haynes, she suffered a heart attack this week in the hospital. She's doing okay, but uh, she could use some prayers. Okay. Any others? I'll probably, oh, somebody I hear, Maxine. How's Maxine? Maxine's doing well. Maxine Helgeson, for those that know her, what a, what a saint and servant for the Lord and lovely lady. Uh, she. A special time that I'll always remember she played for my ordination that happened here, but she got sick yesterday morning and uh, blacked out and from what I understand was caused by possibly just a very sudden blood pressure drop, but they were trying to figure out what's going on with her, but Cindy and her are home as of yesterday afternoon and resting and she's being monitored about her heart, but thank you for your prayers. That lady means a lot to many of us here. Uh, somebody else, I don't know if Vonda's going to mention it. I don't know if she knows, but I, I was at a wedding last night, and Janie uh, Haymaker told me that Billy took a little tumble, and Billy will probably not be happy with me mentioning this. But let's pray for Billy. She's not here. One side of her face does not look good. I haven't got to talk to her. I'll just remind her, true beauty comes from within. doesn't matter, but Janie said, I asked her, are you going to be, go to church tomorrow? No, I'm not going looking like this. But pray for Billy. We love our Billy. Also. Whoops. You know, Kathy Howard, and she lost her sister, Nora, Friday. And we need, she definitely needs prayers from all of us for that situation. Yes. Remember Kathy and Nora's family. Any others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you first and foremost of who you are. We thank you for this building that we can come in and worship you. And as your church, these people, your children, as we come, we recognize who you are and that you are so worthy of our praise and our worship. And then we, as always, have so many requests that we ask that you be a part of these that, have, these that are ill, these that have lost loved ones this week, uh, the many needs that are out there, we ask that your presence would be in their homes, in their lives, in their families, as only you can bring such peace and comfort that is beyond our understanding. We thank you for that. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, be with us today as we do lift your name in hymns of praise as Brother Philip brings your message as the things, all things said, whether it's at the communion table, offering, whatever it may be, may it bring glory and praise to you. And Lord, once again, 
Listen to this prayer. It's the same prayer that your son taught the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing an old hymn that I know I grew up with out of Union Chapel 508, Love Lifted Me. How many of you lifted somebody this week by loving on them? I hope we all did. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Little ones off to children's church as we sing the last verse. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. John. had a praise this morning but I didn't want to do it at the regular time I wanted my own special time to do the praise so. <laughs> last Monday I went to Yukon to lay out the framework for our next building and I was supposed to get there about 10 o'clock to meet with the contractor and I got there a little early and but my son Scott told me, you're going to like Shorty. Said he's a different kind of guy. So I was, didn't know what to expect. So Shorty met me, and we walked towards each other. And I could tell right away why he got a nickname, because he was only like five foot, four inches tall. But the unusual part about him, he had a full beard. And the beard was about down to here. His hair hadn't been trimmed for as long as his beard hadn't been trimmed. He had, had a cap on and it was sticking out. So I didn't know what to expect out of Shorty. But when we met, I put out my hand and said, I'm John, I'm Scott's dad. And he said, glad to meet you, John. I said, I'm Shorty. He said, Scott told me that you were having some health problems. And I said, that's right. I said, I have kidney failure and, and on dialysis, but I said, uh, I'm getting along okay with that. And he said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. And then this ball of hair with the two eyes looking at me <laughs> raised up and looked me straight in the eye and he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I said, I sure do. And he said, well, I would like to pray for you if that's okay. So all this time we're talking, he hasn't let go of my hand. So we're still in a grasp of the handshake. He puts his other hand on my chest. And did I mention we're on the main street? 
in Yukon. <laughs> uh, he, he prayed for me. Three things he prayed for. One, for God to heal me and get me back to health like I should be. And then he prayed that in my Christian walk that I would grow closer to, to my Lord and Savior. And then the last thing was that God would bless me. Now, if you met Shorty without knowing anything about him, you would probably wonder what kind of character this is. And I did myself. I thought, what kind of guy am I meeting here? And it didn't take long to know that he was a Christian, that his faith was in God. And by meeting him, that was a blessing for me. Haven't got to talk to him again and tell him how much I appreciate him, but next time I see him, I will. With this being said, I want to talk about the offering. When you give an offering this morning, if you're given out of thinking that this is what I need to do, you're not doing the right thing. Charlie had a heart that was in the right place. And when you give your offering this morning, no matter how small or how large it is, the same thing needs to be in your heart, that your heart is right with God, and God will bless you for that. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Thank you. We mentioned this song last couple, two, three weeks. Let's sing together. Let's do one and three, Robin. Onward, Christian soldiers, we take up this morning's offering. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before Christ the soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before like a mighty army moves the church of God Christians we are treading where saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to Stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, We thank you for experiences in our life that help us grow. We thank you for Shorty and his testimony to me. We ask that you will help us to keep our hearts right with you and do as you would have us do. We thank you for all you give us, and we ask that you will use these gifts that we have given back to you to your glory. Amen. Amen.
morning. This morning, uh, I tried to get an outline of, for a communion meditation out of this little book that my uh, dad passed down to me. I was, tried to put it into my own words, and it just didn't work. This is it's way more eloquent from this. Uh, we should do some mental ranking of the elements of our worship here on Sunday. Most churches feature various arrangements. The following elements call to worship, prayer, congregational singing, special music, Lord's Supper, offering, scripture reading, sermon, invitation, and benediction. We have most of those elements in our service. If we were to ask every member to list these elements in descending order of importance from top to bottom, we might obtain some unusual results. The ranking, the ranking people might give the sermon could depend on whether or not the preacher told enough humorous stories, or who they were about, probably. <laughs> some members would rate the congregational singing lower if their favorite hymns are not regularly sung. The benediction might appear close to the top. After all, quite a few folk are eager to head for the exit as soon as the last amen is said. The Lord's Supper should appear as number one on every list. The New Testament indicates that this is the primary purpose for assembling on Sunday. Acts 20, number seven, says, I think it's uh, the one about Paul. Yeah, on the first day of the week, we all met together to break bread. Paul spoke to the group because he was planning to leave the next day. He kept on talking till midnight. <clears throat> the Lord's Supper should have appeared, and as it should, the element of our service that touches us, it should be, the communion should be the most, the element that touches us most deeply. 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 16, I think Bob Smith off marks that one. It says, well, anyway, it's, it's a good one. We are communing with Jesus Christ at his table. The sermon, singing, the prayers are all important, but if they rank below this observance of the communion, <clears throat> if anyone gives the Lord's Supper only a second or third place, what does it mean? It may mean the proper frame of mind during the offering, generously sacrificing one of our Oh boy. That the person is not adequately preparing his heart for communing with Jesus. I'm guilty of that sometimes. The minister spends hours preparing his sermon. The musicians, thank the Lord for them, invest time in selecting and rehearsing the hymns. Each worshiper must also spend significant time readying his or her heart to partake of these emblems his broken body and blood. When this is done, communion in itself will be the certain, would be certain and should be the high point of every worship service. I'm just gonna sing a chorus that's called There is a Savior as we come to his table this morning. There is a Savior, what joys express, His eyes are mercy, His word is rest, for each tomorrow, for yesterday. Stand 
as we sing it through again. There is a Savior, what joys express, His eyes are mercy, His word is rest, for each tomorrow, for yesterday. First Corinthians 10, 16 says, we give thanks for the cup of blessing. It is a sharing in the blood of Christ's death, and the bread that we break is sharing in the body of Christ. Please pray with me. Lord God, <laughs> forgive us when we fall short. Help these words and these meditations we heartfelt prepare and let them be let them honor you lord let our let our words that are spoken here bring this congregation and each member that hears it closer to you as we intend it as your will be done here in this church through us and your will be done through us this week as we go about our walk with you Lord these emblems your broken body and this cup represent your book your your dying for us for our forgiveness of sins thank you Lord God I praise you and give you all the honor and glory for as you know I'm just like all the other humans I have I have passed but my future is glorious and bright with you in Jesus name I pray and give thanks and all the glory amen, amen. amen.
This is one of my favorite parts of the worship service, is seeing all the anticipation <laughs> on all the faces, you know. It's kind of like a, some, a small child takes their empty cup up to mom and says, uh, I'm thirsty, fill it up. And that should be the attitude we have as we approach the Word of God. Thank you for being here this morning. And I do ask that you would be in prayer for me as I give the message this morning. Uh, the scripture that we're going to read in a moment, when I first read it, preparing my heart, I said, oh no, I don't want to preach that. Uh, and then the more I immersed myself in it, the more it became precious to me. And uh, I, want, uh, I want to hopefully share with you a little bit of the overflow of what God has said to me uh, in my heart. For those of you that might be visiting, uh, you need to know that as a church we have spent eight to ten weeks in 2 Timothy, and we've covered two chapters. There are four chapters in the book. Uh, and so I want to apologize to all of you for rushing through it so rapidly. <laughs> there were many times when I had more things that God had said to me that needed to be spoken, but I said, uh, I deferred, and I just hurried on through to try to get toward the end. And so for all of you that wanted to spend longer in 2 Timothy than we have, I ask for your uh, forgiveness. We are beginning chapter 3 this morning, which is the first part of the second half of the book. And Paul puts on the mantle of the prophet, uh, and he tells us what is, it's going to be like in the future. Let me set again for you the background. Paul is in prison in Rome. He is facing imminent death from execution. Fearing for the future of the church, he is recruiting Timothy to be his uh, replacement. Timothy is the main man in the city of Ephesus in the continent of Asia. But Timothy has a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, a spirit of insecurity, and he is afraid that he is not going to be able to do the job. So Paul writes the book to encourage Timothy, to tell him you can do it, because God is going to help you to do it. And he says to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. He starts in chapter 2, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And you need to endure like a soldier, remember? That's why we sang onward Christian soldiers this morning. We need to follow the rules like an athlete, persevere like a farmer, be diligent like a workman, be clean like a noble vessel in a house, and be gentle like a servant. And now as we begin the second half of the book of 2 Timothy, Paul says, but now I want to tell you that tough times are coming. Tough times are coming. I titled the message this morning, Dangerous Times, Dangerous Things. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Paul writing to Timothy by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But mark this, pay special attention to this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. 
Just as Janes and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far, because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Father God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning from this passage of Scripture by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. you may be seated. Paul puts on the mantle of the prophet, and he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times or perilous times, dangerous times in the last days. Well, who are these last days? I was raised in a Christian home, in a very conservative home, and uh, there was a lot of study of prophecy. And my impression was that time is going to go on, and as we get closer to the end uh, of the second coming of Jesus, things are going to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, and then uh, the last days are going to happen. But I have found that's not exactly true, because from the biblical perspective, the last days is that period of time between the first coming of Jesus when he was born of a virgin and the second coming of Jesus when he comes back with power and great glory. The Old Testament was the other days. And if you were living in the Old Testament, you were looking forward to the last days. When the Messiah comes, we're going to be living in the last days, the age of the Messiah, the age of salvation by grace, the age after the blood has been shed on the cross. And so we are living in the last days. In Acts chapter 1, verse 16, on the day of Pentecost, he was quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel, and he said, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. The last days are the age of the Holy Spirit. And so we are in the last days. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God spoke in, in the past in various times and ways to the prophet's to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son Jesus Christ. And so you need to understand that the last days are not some time that's going to be coming way off in the future when things are really bad. But the last days began when Jesus was raised from the dead. And the last days continue all the way until Jesus comes back. So Max... You are living in the last days. All right. But if we look in the text, it says in the last days there will be perilous times. And this word perilous times means short windows of time. Short pieces of time that are going to be peculiarly difficult. Short period. There are going to be seasons when things are really difficult during the period of the last days. And you can look back through history and you can see there were periods of intense difficulty. Uh, if I could mention just one, I remember when uh, the Nazi regime was growing in ascendancy in Germany and in Europe, and it led to an entire World War II. And there were terrible things that were happening throughout the world. That was a relatively brief period of time, a perilous time that was within the last days. And so he says to Timothy, Timothy, get ready, because during this period that you're living in the last days, there are going to be moments, periods of time that are going to be very, very, very difficult. We are living in the last days, and there will be periods that are extremely difficult. And then he starts listing some of the dangers of these perilous times. 
And the list is quite impressive and kind of depressive. And, uh, you know, as we read it, I could just almost see your face turning a little bit white, you know. How how can we talk about all that much bad stuff in one sermon? Uh, It's kind of like what you were saying. But I want to make a couple observations before we get into the text. The dangerous things that are happening in these dangerous times are all character traits. The biggest danger is not the Democrats. Somebody say amen. Amen. (laughs) The greatest danger is not the government. The greatest danger is not crime or COVID. The greatest danger are the character traits that grow in your own heart as you quit giving God first place. The greatest danger is in you. It's not out there. It's right here. Greatest danger isn't way over. The greatest danger is right here in Dover Christian Church. It's in the hearts of people. All of these items in the list are character deficits. So I want to tell you about the church. Do you know what the number one purpose of the church is? Why does the church exist on planet Earth? Number one, it's character formation. Character formation, which begins by regeneration... You give in your heart to Jesus and Jesus sends his Holy Spirit in you and makes you alive to God when you used to be dead to, toward God. So you became God's child and then you are to grow up to be like God in your character. And when you come to church, you're, the, the, church is, the church service is not primarily evangelistic to get some, uh, some sinner to come walk forward and accept Jesus as Savior. That should be happening out on the street Monday through Saturday. The Sunday morning from 10.30 to 12 is when the Word of God is being spoken to the people of God, telling you how to live like God and to become Christ-like in your life. And the greatest danger in the last days is going to be when the church gets more involved in events and programs and entertainment and less emphasis on the lordship of Jesus Christ, and character goes out the window, and church members start living as if God did not exist. They still name the name of God. They've even confessed Jesus as Savior, but they are not regenerate. They are not living the life that Jesus wants them to live inside. That is the danger of the last days. Not guns, not government, not crime, not disease, but character. I could read the list again. Every one of them goes to character. The dangerous times that are going to happen in the last days are when God's people forget about character. Okay, with that as an observation, let me get into this actual list. What I want to do is tell you that there are two things at the very front of the list and two things at the very end of the list And there are two things in the middle of the list that hold the entire list together. The two at the front of the list are love. And the two at the bottom of the list are love. And the two in the middle of the list are love. And all of the other deficit character traits are because you love wrong. What you love 
is the most dangerous thing that will happen in the last days. And this is what the Lord told me as I was reading the scripture and studying it and preparing to stand before you this morning. The Proverbs writer, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, says, Above all things, note that, Above all things, guard your heart. For out of your heart are the issues of life. That is, everything else that happens in life is because of what is happening in your heart. And so you have to guard your heart. And what, what Paul says is in the last days, in these last times, they're going to have a love problem. We're going to go through this list. Six indictments of love. Do you have these printed there, uh, Robin? Okay. First of all, it says people are going to be lovers of... What is it? Church? Lovers of themselves. You know, Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But in these terrible times of the last days, we will not deny ourselves, we will love ourselves and deny Him. Lovers of themselves is the most terrible indictment of the last days. The second one, lovers of many. Everybody say amen. amen. I was going to ask everybody to give me your wallet this morning to uh, kind of help you be more spiritual. <laughs> Lovers of money. Money is not wrong. It is the love of money that is all wrong. Do you know why God tells you to tithe? To keep your heart straight? Because when you give some of your money to God, when you give the first tenth of the, your money to God, it keeps you from loving money and puts the love of God above love of money. See, when you love yourself, then you start loving money. You know why? Because money is the way you get what you want. Number two in the list is number lovers of money. Number three on the list is without natural love. Without natural love. And this is a different word for love. There are three words in, for love in the New Testament. Agape, which is godlike love, is not even mentioned in this list. Phileo love is mentioned five times. Phileo is brotherly love. It's love of people. I, I, I like you, so let's go to the baseball game together. You know, that's phileo love. Come from, we use that word in the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. You know, uh, but the word here without natural love is storge, which is natural love. It's the love of, that is found in nature. The other morning I was looking in the flower bed of our front yard. There was a cedar little bush there and I scared a robin out of its nest. I looked in the nest and there was a little robin egg, just one so far. The love of a robin for its egg. Natural love. The love of a duck for its duckling. The love of a sow for its pigs. The love of a cow for its calf. In these terrible times of the last days, there will be no natural love. People will love themselves and love many and love nothing else. Somebody said in the last days it will be get all you can, can all you get, and set on the lid. Number four, not lovers of the good. That is, not lovers of other, not lovers of the good of, of others. In the last days, people will love themselves, they will love money, they will not love anything natural, and they will not love other people. 
You've probably been taught that joy in the Bible is Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. J-O-Y. Jesus, others, yourself. But when we turn that around, we love ourselves first, then we don't love others or God at all. The next one on the list, lovers of pleasure. Lovers of pleasure. Happiness and good times. Lovers of pleasure. And then the last one on the list, not lovers of God. See, in these terrible times of the last days, there's going to be a total inverting of the values of the Christian faith. Rather than loving God and denying ourselves, we love ourselves and deny God. And that opens the door to almost everything else that is in the list. I am going to... Uh, what, go over it uh, very, very briefly. Here it is. Boasting about oneself. Proud, putting self over others. Abusive, blasphemer, putting self over God. Disobedient to parents, putting yourself over parents. Ungrateful, a spirit of entitlement. I just hate it when no Joe Namath comes on the telephone and says, you're not getting everything you deserve. How many of you have seen that on television? I just want to throw my boot through the television and say, what makes you think you deserve it? But we, the world is filled with this idea that I deserve more than I have and you are supposed to give it to me. Unholy. No respect for the sacred, unforgiving. The idea there is making no truce. You know, in negotiation, each one gives a little bit and you can find a common denominator. Unforgiving here is I will not give up anything to anybody for any reason. I'm in it for me and that is it. Slanderous, inventing and spreading evil reports without self-control. There's nothing that holds them back. And so they are brutal, untamed, unrestrained by anything. Treacherous, betrayers like Judas, rash, headstrong, literally falling forward. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do and go where I want to go and nobody is going to stop me come hell or high water. It's me and mine or the highway in the last days. That's what's so terrible about it. And then conceited, literally puffed up. Oh man, these are terrible times, amen? But it's all about love. You see, agape love, the love of God, or the love that is like God's love, is the most wonderful thing in the world. The love of God, or the love that is like God's love, is the most wonderful, most powerful thing in the world. But love turned inward love of myself is the most deceitful and damning thing in the world. So now, having set that as the background of what the text says, I'm going to start preaching. I'm going to start applying this to you and to me. Here's what I want you to take home. What you love is the most dangerous component of the last days. Think about that. What you love, not what you hate, not what you fear, but what you love is the most dangerous thing in your life. You are more apt to go to hell because of what you love than because of what you fear. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. 
So I wanted to illustrate this a little bit this morning. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mark, would you come up here? Stand beside me. How many of you know this guy? <clears throat> I know his first name, Mark. I can't remember his last name. What is it? Vincent? <laughs> Henry. Henry, come up here. <laughs> Stand beside me. <laughs> right, right, right here. Face to face. Are you packing? All right. I want you to take out your gun, and I want you to lay it right there. Oh, turn it. To, uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Don't, don't, don't point it toward Mac for anything like that. Yeah, okay. We have a natural fear of guns. A lot of violence is done by fears. But I want to show you something that is more dangerous than guns. What's that? More people are going to go to hell because of baseball than because of guns. More people miss the worship of God because of baseball than because of guns. Lovers of pleasure. We don't hate baseball. We love baseball. We enjoy baseball. And that's why it is so dangerous. Do you get the point? What we fear is what's going to send us to hell if we don't guard our heart very, very, very carefully. Uh, Jeff, would you come up here and stand beside me? I called Jeff and I asked him if he would... Uh, wear his uniform, and he did. Uh, thank you. Come over here and stand beside me here. Uh, by the way, do you know why officers wear uniforms? I'm giving up some of your secrets. It's an intimidation factor. When, when I see somebody that's in a uniform like this, I feel a little bit of... <laughs> trepidation, a little bit of anxiety. It's not just him. He represents the force, the power of the United States government. And I know what he's carrying on his hip. And he probably has a pair of handcuffs that can take away my freedom. <laughs> government. How many of you fear government? I fear government. But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I want to show you something that is going to send more people to hell than government. Can you catch? <laughs> what is this? All right, what's your favorite football team? Dallas Cowboys, Boomer Sooners, Boomer Sooners. Let me see, uh, OSU Cowboys, all right. How many of you love your football? Come on. I love the Dallas Cowboys. Nothing wrong with that. But I have to guard my heart that I don't love it more than I love God. Because if I love football more than I love God, it will send me to hell. So, football, dangerous. In the last days, people will become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Well, I have another one over here. What is it? Read it. Read it. 1910 American Rye Whiskey. American Rye Whiskey. I would, now this is a mixed, this is a mixed thing. Some of you love alcohol and some of you fear alcohol. And so that it is in your heart, but you'll have to decide how you deal with it. But all my life I've heard sermons about the evils of alcohol. 
and how love of alcohol can hurt you and hurt your family. A lot of truth to that. I'm not saying that's wrong. But I want to tell you something that's more dangerous than alcohol. Are you ready for this? Hold this for me, will you, Jeff? How many of you know what this is? No, it's not a projector. Projectors are not dangerous. What is it? This represents camping. Now, let me tell you what this is for me. This is my old-time coon hunting lantern. Now, no, none of you can ask me why I still have it. I haven't coon hunted for 60 years or so, but I still have my lantern. The reason, you don't see this very often. The reason it has this reflector on the back is because when you're running through the woods chasing the blue tick hound that's running as fast as he can trying to tree that raccoon in the middle of the night, you want the light out in front of you. You don't want it shining in your eyes. So not too many people have seen that on a, on a Coleman lantern. You probably haven't seen it in 40 years. Now, I realize I'm old-fashioned, and you, nobody uses Coleman lanterns anymore. But I'm just using this as an illustration of going camping. Going camping or going hunting is more dangerous than alcohol. Now, alcohol can be dangerous if you love it, too. I, I covered that. A lot of you, if you love alcohol, be careful. But more people in Dover Christian Church are tempted by going camping and going hunting than by going to the bar. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of themselves, Lovers of many, more than lovers of others, and lovers of the good, and the lovers of God. Well, I don't have anything to compare it to, but I want to tell you this is one of the most dangerous things of all. Somebody say amen. Now, I want to tell you this is mine. And this is not my only one. I have, <laughs> I could stock a sporting goods store. I have a garage at one of my rent houses, big garage, and I said, okay, renter, you can have half of it, and I'll take the other half. You know what I have in that other half? Fishing, fishing gear. One time I counted, I think I have 12 tackle boxes. You know, one for bait fishing, and one for plug fishing, and one for spinner fishing, and one for trot line fishing. I've got it all. And I have to really guard my heart. Because of love of pleasure, more than lovers of God, is going to be the dangerous, Dangerous times of the last days. Thank you all. You can be seated. Give him a hand, would you? So let me wind this sermon down with just a couple observations. What does all this mean? Does this mean that you should never drink any alcohol, never go to a baseball game, Never play football, never go fishing, never go hunting, never go camping? No. What it means is you, above all things, guard your heart. Because out of your heart is everything else that matters. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I don't have any pat answers to tell you what you can and can't do about your baseball and your football and, and all of that. But I'm telling you, as a Christian, you need to get alone someplace and talk to God about it and pray about it and let the Holy Spirit lead you and make your own decisions to make sure that you don't love them more than you should. I need some help here. Somebody say amen. 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 Let me tell you this. Everything you do is teaching your children the importance of the faith principles in your own life. If you take your kids to a football game or a baseball game, as a parent, you need to spend some time thinking, how can I make sure that my kids don't love baseball and football more than I love God. Let's say you're at a baseball game on a Sunday morning. That happens. Well, one, one alternative would be to just say, I'm not going to go, I'm going to go to church. But you know what? Church is not something you go to. Church is something you are. Steve, you are the church. Church isn't where you go. Church is who you are. And so the question for you, Steve, if you're going to a baseball game, is how can I be the church at this baseball game? A thought comes to mind. I don't know whether the... You know, at baseball, they have a seventh inning stretch. Right? So what if we got together with some of the coaches and, and said, on the PA, you say, well, you know, guys, this is we're playing baseball on Sunday morning, so I've asked John Doe to come up here and read a scripture and give a prayer for our seventh inning stretch. Whoa! We have honored God at the baseball game, and some people that don't even go God, don't even know God, might hear about God, and they might start loving God at the baseball game. And we have become, we've changed baseball to be in something that honors God rather than destroys God. Football game, they have the tailgate parties, right? How many of you know what a tailgate party is? Are there ever any prayers at a tailgate party? There could be. If you were being the church, church doesn't just happen on Sunday morning. You'd meet together and say, hey, let's thank God for football and let's thank God for the teams and let's ask God to, to protect the, the players and uh, we're just going to have a, a moment to... Ask God to be with us at our football game. And all of a sudden we have been, you are the church at football rather than attending church on Sunday morning. We're going hunting, okay, Steve? We're going hunting with our kids. We're out at the lake camping. And it comes more Sunday morning. How about the, you gather all the kids together and say, Hey kids, you know we're out here at the lake on Sunday morning, so we're not going to church, and so we are going to read a scripture, and we're going to sing a song, and I'm going to talk to you for two or three minutes about God before we go skiing. Could you do that? What have you done? You are now being the church at your camp out 
rather than just waiting for church to be something you attend on Sunday morning. You have taught your kids that even out at the lake you're still a Christian and that God is still important. And hopefully your kids have gotten the message that you are a lover of God more than lover of pleasure. Because in the last days there will be terribly dangerous times because people will love themselves and love money and love pleasure more than they love God. Let's pray. Father, this has been a very pointed sermon. And so I need the help of the Holy Spirit so that it is not just the words of a preacher, but it is the words of God. And Father, let us take them home and think about them and find out how we can live them in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This morning our invitation hymn kind of goes right along with this message what a life would be like without him so if you've experienced that and uh, have not experienced what a life would be like with Jesus this is a hymn that gives you that invitation and for all of us to think about where exactly is Christ in our lives let's stand as we sing our invitation hymn without him I could do nothing without him I could do nothing Without him I'd surely fail Without him I would be drifting Like a ship without a sail Jesus, oh Jesus Do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I would be dying. Without him. Without him, life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him. And all God's people said, I just want to encourage you today to know and realize, uh, Brother Philip touched on this today, Monday through Saturday is very important for us. He's done his job of being the minister here on Sunday morning, but we all have a job the next six days before we come back here to meet again. The Lord used me this week with some families that need to know God's love. And I'm not the only one standing in this sanctuary he wants to use this week. So, as I shared early, earlier when we sang that hymn, Love Lifted Me, be that minister this week and love and lift up the love of Christ to those around you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being in the midst of your people this morning. I sense and know how difficult and pointed service it was for 
the message that Philip brought this morning for each one of us. But we do, I pray that we as your church at Dover Christian Church want to be lovers of you. But yet we are just like everybody else in this world and every day tempted with other things pulling at us and tugging at our hearts. But first and foremost, help us to be lovers of Jesus Christ that you have called us to be. Go with us from this place. Be with all the many that aren't here this morning, whether it be illnesses and, again, those that have lost loved ones this week. Help us to love them. Be with each one of us this week and the next six days as you use us as ministers of your love. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice.